quantum mechanics and the shape of atoms as discovered by Schrodinger. We all know about quantum mechanics, which is of course the physics theory that describes atoms and elementary particles, how they move around like slushy little waves, and interestingly, it predicts what they look like, what shape they have. It was invented in the first couple of decades of the 20th century by a lot of people all working together. Amongst them were Planck, Heisenberg, Bohr, Davison, Dubreuil, Einstein, and of course Schrödinger. These guys already knew a lot about atoms from the scientists who came before them. For instance, they knew that there are about a hundred different atoms in nature, and that these atoms join in larger structures such as molecules, metal lattices, and salt lattices to make everything we see around us. But what they didn't know, what exactly was going on on the inside of the atom, what it was made of, what shape it has. So they were doing experiments on that. And pretty soon they found out that atoms themselves are composed of smaller particles. They found the proton and the electron and they were feederizing the neutron. And with the protons and neutrons they almost immediately knew what the deal was. They realized that they were clumped in a very tiny core at the center of the atom. And that core was really small. A typical atom is about 300 picometers across, whereas that core is typically 0.01 picometers. So this leaves this big open space in an atom, and they realized that this open space was going to be the domain of the electron. But what they didn't know was exactly how the electrons are filling this space. If they are spinning around or orbiting or what. So they made an initial sketch. They called it the planetary model of the atom. Basically the core at the center and the electrons spinning around in big orbits. It was their first idea of what an atom looks like. It proved to be incorrect, but it was a fine enough starting point. It made some very nice predictions and it allowed them to start doing experiments, and they did. One man who was looking at these experiments was a Frenchman called Dubreuil, and he was noticing something very interesting. He found that when electrons were forced to interact with matter, either through some physical process or by hitting a detector, that the electrons presented themselves as particles, as hard little balls of matter. Kind of what you expect them to do. But when the electrons were allowed to move on their own, either by being shot through a crystal or allowed to wander through a vacuum, they always propagated as if they were waves. It was almost as if when you stop messing around with the electron, it would suddenly fall apart into some sort of wave function, some sort of probability wave that sloshed around all of space and predicted where the electron was likely next to be found. This was the first time they encountered particle wave duality in matter, and it spelled disaster for their planetary model. Because this model really assumed that the electron stays a particle during the entire orbit and doesn't fall apart into a wave halfway through. So they needed a new model, but they realized that this model couldn't come from classical mechanics, because classical mechanics makes the same assumption that particles stay particles. In fact, they would need entire new mechanics, something, some new theory that included the wave-like nature of particles. And this is when Schrodinger entered the picture. He had looked at the experiments as well, and he found one common theme running through all of them. In his insight, he saw one law of nature, one equation that seemed to hold no matter what you did. He called it the wave equation. Nowadays, we simply know it as the Schrodinger equation because it was the rock-solid core onto which all of quantum mechanics was built. Schrodinger realized that with this equation he was now in a very interesting position. What he could do is take an atom, any atom, take its properties, stuff like its mass and its charge, all those numbers, put that in that equation, do the math on it, and what he would end up with would be a series of pictures that showed what that atom looks like. He went on and did it for hydrogen, which is the easiest atom, it's just one proton, one electron. And that one proved to be crucial into unlocking the shapes of all the other atoms. And when he had worked his way through the math, these are the pictures he found. Ladies and gentlemen, the shapes of hydrogen. So this then is how an electron fills the empty space in an atom. Not by spinning around, but instead with its blobby shaped wave function, which we call the orbital. What I've drawn here each time is just the same hydrogen atom with a proton at the center and the electron has been allowed to go into a different orbital each time by giving it energy for instance. And if you look at this one, these three blobs together form that one orbital. They house that one single electron. And this one makes a fine example. We can look a bit at its properties. 
What you can do in an experiment is take a hydrogen atom and prepare it in this orbital by giving it some energy, for instance. And if you leave it undisturbed, then the electron takes this shape. It becomes this wave function, this blobby shape. And if you then were to take a measurement of the electron, find out where it actually is, what would happen is this wave function suddenly collapses. It condenses into a single point, which we call the electron. If you then were to re-prepare your hydrogen atom in the same orbital, maybe give it some new energy, then you can do a new measurement and you can find that electron in the same blob or in any of the other blobs. And if you were to repeat this thousands of times, you would end up with a picture very much like this. Notice that there's a higher probability of encountering the electron at the center of a blob. There the probability wave function becomes more dense. But there's something interesting about these pictures, of course, something that is, well, staring us in the face. The fact that these blobs are not connected. There's an area in between where you cannot encounter the electron. So it kind of begs the question, how on earth is the electron traveling from one blob to another? Is it teleporting or what? This was one of the important questions that led to 40 years of heated debate that ended up with Einstein saying very angry things about dice. But who cares? Schrodinger had made an important discovery. He had found the shapes of hydrogen. And using that as a basis, those that came after him were able to find the shapes of all the other atoms. They are very much based on hydrogen. They use the same orbitals. It's just that the higher atoms consist of more electrons. Therefore, they require more orbitals to house all of them. So you end up with a situation where the orbitals all get stacked on top of one another, overlapping but not mixing. They do, however, repel because that's what electrons do, they repel one another. So the orbitals begin distorting each other according to some very complicated math. But these guys were also good at what they were doing. And combined with Schrodinger's discovery, they had now made a link between physics and chemistry. A link which in fact led to an entire revolution in both of them. So with that, I would like to conclude by just saying, Mr. Schrodinger, thank you very much.